Thank you for joining to the morning. And it's again lovely to see all of you. And <clears throat> we will start as usual with a mindful breathing meditation or exercise to quiet and calm our mind for a few more minutes. Excuse me, Ben. Um, Geshi, we do have a a large group of people working out at the center. And I, we just wanted to let you know that um, work okay. continues even on Sundays. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Then we can try to cultivate good intention for being here. May all of us come in here together. And sharing the time together, even if it's on, online with the, all of us. wanting to learn something meaningful that can be helpful in our life. So that we can be more kind, more compassionate, more patient, more understanding. More wisdom. <clears throat> having improved those qualities so that we can be more help benefit to others. At least that we don't intentionally hurt and harm others. And may we be able to apply whatever we learn, those advice instructions as much as possible in our everyday life. Not just listening, but may we be able to 
integrate and apply as much as possible. So that <clears throat> we can be more benefit to others as well as that we can find more peace in ourselves. And may it be called conditions to achieve our highest potential, fully enlightened, fully awakened state as soon as possible. Okay. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create to listen to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all things and things. Sangye, Chodam, Pogye, Sonam, Changju, Badu, Dhamme, Gai. Sagye, Chodje, Kedre, Sonam, Jola, Penche, Sangye, Dubash. Sangye, Chodam, Pogye, Sonam, Changju, Badu, Dhamme, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, if everyone can turn off their, um, if they can mute their, because we hear a little bit of uh, what you call uh, echo. So if everyone, can, if everyone can mute, that will help the sound. So again, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone, um, you know, um, for last two, three years, you know, many of people have um, worked so hard uh, to, to support the centers, um, you know, with their time, energy, uh, resource, um, everything. And, um, and I think we are coming to quite soon that we will be able to open and to be able to have a um, class in persons in a, such a beautiful place. And especially today, I think there are quite a lot of people who are at the center trying to help to clear the weeds and clean up around there. Um, so again, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone and, and yeah, um, for everyone's support directly, indirectly, you know, and so that the center can flourish, so the center can provide, you know, be a place for people to learn, you know, learn um, the institutions to learn about mind and transforming their mind, you know. Um, so that we can continue to not only at our time, hopefully, and after many generations, you know. Um, so, and I also um, request and encourage people to help when the center opens, probably we need even more help. Um, there is more, um, when the center open, you know, um, yeah, we will need even more 
volunteers even more help than uh, in the past um, because it's a bigger place, bigger property and a lot of things to take care of. And so again, um, I will, um, so I just wanted to kind of make that so that uh, we will definitely appreciate very much. Everyone will appreciate that very much. You know, in whatever way that you can help, in whatever way you can contribute, in whatever way you can be supportive. Um, so yeah, so that is um, what I just wanted to kind of begin. Um, so then coming to the today's uh, the itself, you know, I think for last seven, eight weeks, I think more than eight weeks, maybe. Yeah, uh, we have been going through this um, very short, you know, it's like two, three phases, um, but full of very practical, very beneficial um, advice, instructions, and teachings by the great Adisha and uh, this particular text on mind training. Uh, <clears throat> The Bodhisattva Garden of the Jewel, and we are coming to a kind of, you know, um, end of that. Quite, we have finished most of them, and so, and then you know, I think we we are on um, page number two, you know, and then the last, uh, the last line of the, that page number two in that particular. Um, so again, in order to follow the both of the path and practice, in order to be help and benefit to the uh, all sentient being, to the world, to the society, uh, to the community, you know, um, in order to be that, we need to have a, you know, um, confidence and courage. The more confidence and courage we have, the more we are able to do for others. Not really do for ourselves, we'll be, but if we, um, if we lose the courage and confidence um, in our own ability, in, in our own, in, to our own self, then, you know, um, then it will be much more difficult and challenge and to be any help and benefit to others, you know, um, because, yeah. Uh, because we don't feel confidence enough, courage enough uh, in our own, in our self, in our ability to do something for others and to be benefit to others. So, you know, and so therefore having a courage and confidence, self-confidence and courage is very important factors. And, and so, you know, it's related with that. Here in that, the last line of page number two, where it's all, whenever you feel discouraged or inadequate. And again, we go through those kind of emotions time, time to time, you know. Um, yeah, you know um, sometimes even we try our best, you know, things doesn't go well. Uh, thing doesn't turn out so well as we wish, um, as we want it. And when that happens, in order for things to turn out, everything go well, it requires many, many different cause and conditions. You know, it's not one sided. Like everything, you know, dependent on license. Depending on our license, I mean, depending on so many factors, so many conditions. Even you did your best to your ability, but due to lack of other conditions, 
maybe you know there is not enough strong karma uh, to make that change, whether in our personal life or whether it is in our uh, community or, or country and uh, in the world itself. Sometimes, and sometimes there is no other factors from other side as well. And when all those doesn't come, sometimes thing doesn't go the one as we wish or as we want to go. And when those things happen, sometimes it might make us very discouraged. And sometimes we might caution ourselves of our own ability, feeling inadequate, you know, I'm not good enough, you know, um, Maybe it's my problem. Maybe I'm, um, I don't have the skill. Maybe I'm not the right person. So all these kind of thoughts would arise, cautioning our own abilities and, uh, and ourselves, you know, and, and that can be when that happens, then it can lead to a kind of discouragement and lose confidence. Um, and when we become discouraged and lose the confidence, self-confidence, then you know it can have a very, very negative impact. You know, um, then you lose kind of you know your energy, you know, to do something before you have kind of energy and excitement to make things happen you know, to change things, whether it's for yourself or for any community or society or countries. You have the kind of enthusiasm, strong excitement and interest. And, and then, you know, we feel inadequate or we discourage and then, you know, you feel, you know, forget about it. Let whatever happened, happen it, you know, so you kind of become kind of um, disconnected and um, and you it, then you become kind of careless you know you don't care what happens you know and that kind of things can become a very very um, had this negative impact on yourself and to the community to the society the world itself when one individual and many individual become like that uh -huh. and so um so no matter how much difficult it is no matter how challenging it is we should always try to uplift our mind and not be discouraged and not lose the self-confidence you know uh, so that's where Raise your, that is where it says, raise your spirit and encourage yourself. And so trying to raise the spirit, you know, and by raising and uplifting the, your spirit and cultivating strong courage and self-confidence. Mm. So we have to remember, you know, um, many factors have to come in together. Many, many different factors from many sides, from many different parts has to come together um, to be able to make something change, positive change, um, you know, in order to solve the problem. In order to solve the problem and in order to have a positive changes whether it's the external positive changes or whether it's internal positive changes, even in our mind. 
it's not just one conditions or one factors, many, many cause and conditions and factors have to come together, you know. So therefore, you know, sometimes even from our side, even we do our best, give our best, and there's nothing, you know, problem from your side. That's all you can do. There's nothing more you can do than that in that point in this, in this time, in your circumstances. But still sometimes, you know, due to lack of other factors, things might not go the right way. And in those cases, then, you know, we have to kind of not be too harsh on ourselves, you know, not be too harsh on ourselves and beat up ourselves so much. Instead, you know, I try my best, but things are not moving as we wish because it depends on many factors and not only the factors and due to lack of many other factors coming together. Sometimes that is why it is not moving in that way. So with that understanding, you know, from the coming point of view, with the timing, you know, many other conditions, factors. And so with that, then we try to be more gentle with ourselves. We try to be more gentle with ourselves. Try to be more compassionate to yourself, more gentle to yourself, and not beat up yourself and feeling, you know, of I'm not good enough, I'm inadequate, you know, and I'm bad persons, or I'm stupid persons, or all kinds of those different feelings, different thoughts that can arise to to make it things even worse, our mind very, you know, dark and depressed and discouraged, you know, losing confidence and all of that, you know. So, because that doesn't help, that doesn't help, that doesn't help anyone, that only makes things worse. You know? So not giving any space for those thoughts to arise and to be there too much, but instead trying to contemplate, you know, and from many other factors, you know, that is not because things were not right, not necessarily just because of yourself, but because of many other factors, you know, and so that through that one way of thinking that way, so um, we can stop being too too harsh on ourselves and being too discouraged and lose self-confidence. You know, um, and one of the other things is that, you know, sometimes we are very impatient. You know, we can be very impatient. Um, and especially in this, I think in modern time, we want everything, the result to be very quick everything has to be very quick. And so again, with that kind of impatience and in expecting the changes, positive changes, or to solve the problem quickly. And when it is unable to be that, then again, we can be discouraged and again, we can lose confidence. And sometimes it's not because there's no, because there's no improvement, you know. Even though there's improvement, even though there is positive changes happening, but it's not happening as quick as we want. Or the changes are happening, but it's not happening as big as we want. And so instead of feeling positive that because the change is happening, because there is some improvement, but instead we become very negative because our expectation not met and because we are impatient, you know. And so therefore, again, being more patient, you know, being more patient can help and 
not having too much high expectation can also help to not to be discouraged too easily and give up too easily. And, you know, um, so those, uh, those practice, those qualities will help us as well. Um, from being too easily discouraged and give up too easily. You know, um, because if we become discouraged and we, we give up too easily, then, you know, even whatever small progress we have made, you know, even that will be gone soon, you know. But if you don't lose your courage and confidence, and even we are making small progress, but if we continue to work on that from small progress and with the time, with the effort, um, it will make you, you know, small to big and bigger positive changes and transformations. So, and also remembering, you know, no matter, you know, what happens, you know, remember that we all have Buddha nature all the time. Being remembered and being aware, we all have the Buddha nature. Every sentient beings have that Buddha nature. And therefore, every sentient beings have the potential to be more kind, most kind, more com most compassionate person. Every sentient beings has the potential to be more wise and potential to be free from all the delusions, all the ignorance. You know, once we realize that, being aware and recognize and being aware and realize that, whether it's ourselves, whether it's others, you know, we don't lose the hope so easily. We don't lose the hope easily either ourselves because we make some mistake or someone make mistake because everyone has that potential. It's only a matter of time before everyone's able to actualize that full potential. It might take time, it might take more time for certain individuals than others. But at the end, there is end to all this problem. There is end to all these sufferings. There's end to all that. So I feel that is very important to have that fundamental, on fundamental level. You know, that is our nature, basic nature of all sentient beings. That is our basic nature, that's our fundamental nature. And therefore, you know, that being the fundamental nature, the basic nature being that, you know. There's a hope, regardless of whatever different um, challenges that we might be encountering time to time. Regardless of whatever difficulties, um, adversary situations that we might be encountering as an individual, as a um, collectively, you know, but on because of that basic fundamental nature of that altruistic and uh, Buddha nature, then you know all this can eventually all this come to end. Eventually, it will all come to the end. Can be end, and not can be end. It will come to the end. You know, I think um, to have that. On the, on the depth level of that understanding. I think it's uh, crucial to have more confidence in self and to others, even when we face obstacles. Mm. So through meditating on, by meditating on, you know, Buddha nature, then we 
can try to cultivate more self confidence and encourage um, courage, courage, attitude. You know. Um, And by you know reading on some of those inspiring people's life, whether it's uh, spiritual leaders, masters, whether it's uh, different individuals in different fields, you know, where they have gone through a lot of adversity, difficulties, challenges in their life, and they never give up, they never be discouraged, they're always kind of even though other people think they can never make it, they can never overcome it, but they didn't, they believe that they can overcome it and they have their self-confidence. They, they never got discouraged and continue to work on that and then overcome all the obstacles and become a great example, inspirations for thousands and millions of people continue to be, uh, you know, inspirations, will be inspiration for the future generations, you know. And so again, if they can overcome such a extreme challenges, one after another, one after another, because they never give up, because they never lose the confidence in themselves, because they never become discouraged. And therefore, with that courage and self-confidence, at the end, they prevail and reach the point where they reach. And with that, then it's also by reading those, also can give some inspiration for us in our life as well, you know, when we are going through those different challenges and compared to their challenge and my challenge, nothing is a small, you know. My adversity is nothing compared to their, And if they can overcome it, I can also overcome it. I also have the same potential like they have. We all are same human beings. We have the same potentials, you know. So with that kind of, again, you know, encouraging yourself and having the self-confidence and not being discouraged, hopeless, and give up, you know. Um, once we become hopeless, then that is it, you know, that is it. Mm. Then you have lost the battle. Once we become discouraged and hopeless, that's when we, we lose the battle. You know, until, until you lose your hope, you still can, there's a chance that we can win the battle, you know, with whatever challenge and difficulty that we might be dealing with. But once we lose the hope, then that's it. And so therefore, and then next one is always meditate on emptiness. So, you know, up to here, you know, mostly different advice, different instructions that support the practice of the method, that support the practice of the method, which is, you know, uh, that support the practice of loving kindness, compassion, bodhisattva mind, that support the practice of patience, that support the practice of moral discipline, you know, that support the practice of material concentrations, you know, and interesting and virtues, you know, that support the uh, different meditation practice instruction that support for us to, you know, um, improve uh, the, our practice of method side, you know, method side, and also to be more kind, help, and benefit to others. And next, you know, is a instruction and advice practice to improve the wisdom side, you know, the wisdom, the wisdom realizing the ultimate uh, truth or reality, you know. So that's where, and always meditate on emptiness. 
in trying to uh, contemplate, meditate on emptiness as much as we can, according to what you are our understanding. You know, of course, um, we might have a different level of understanding of emptiness. You know, for a very beginner, they might have some understanding of emptiness, maybe not depth enough. For someone who, who who have been studying and learning and practicing for a while, they might have more deeper understanding, uh, more broader understanding. And so according to whatever your understanding of that, whatever level you are, you know, trying to apply that, you know, the teaching on the emptiness is not kind of just intellectual, you know, just getting the idea what the, um, uh, you know, what the natural phenomena, you know, it's not just to collect the informations, you know, once you have studied it, once you have understood intellectually, then we have to put into the practice so that intellectual understanding becomes experiential understanding. And when you have that experiential understanding, then that is when it's going to have a strong impact in your life. Uh, you will have strong impact in that in your life positive impact. That is when it started your, our delusion, affected emotion, disturbing emotion started to, you know, become less and less, less and less intense, less and less strong, and less and less arising of that, you know. And even it arises, it's not strong. You know, and it does not last for long, you know. And slowly, slowly, then eventually, you know, we can even overcome from arising even for a short time, you know. And slowly, slowly, we can overcome it, even from arising or very subtle and very, uh, you know, very small affective emotions. And you know? so then that is where you, you begin to see um, yeah. Of course, if you read all the different teachings by all the great masters, you know, that's what they have described, you know. And, you know, even uh, His Holy Dalai Lama in our time, he also shared some of his experiences. And he, he also ex shared experience, you know, that he had been studying and trying to meditate, contemplate on that over 40, 50 years, you know, um, more seriously, you know. Uh, he said, you know, of course he studied when he was young, but he wasn't so serious about that. But after, you know, after he came to India, then he, he kind of, um, really from his side, he started to really study more depth, seriously, and continue to study and contemplate in that. And because of that, he have some, you know, experience, experiential understanding of the emptiness, not just intellectual, but experiential understanding of the emptiness, you know. And because of that, after he had that, because of that, he said, hardly any delusion arises. Hardly any delusions arises. And even if it arises sometime, it's for a very short period, very short period, it arises and goes. And that is the effect, that is the effect of the wisdom realizing the emptiness is the effect of that realizations of the emptiness. I think, you know, I have shared that story with some, you know, but, you know, I refrained, you know, um, who is from Belarus, you know, um, and then, you know, yeah, I, I first met him in Kopan when I was teaching and he was attending that. 
And then, you know, over the time, um, we had met quite a few times um, when I was traveling in Europe, different places. And, and he has been very seriously studying and practicing, you know, um, and one of the time uh, he came to see me to discuss something about his experience and you know trying to discuss um, see if I can give any kind of insight in that and so on. Um, so he 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 has been meditating on emptiness, you know. And he said he had meditated on one. And then one time when he was in that meditation on the self, you know, the emptiness of the self, you know, um, he felt like, you know, um, the self kind of disappearing or dissolving, you know, the self that he felt so strongly before the meditation, you know, in that meditation, as he got deeper in his meditation, the, the self that was feeling very strong before started to kind of disappear and kind of dissolve, you know. And that kind of led him to a kind of, kind of fear, you know, fear of losing yourself, losing of your identity, you know, everything that you are, all of that and fear arises in them. And then he, when the fear arises, he tried to do the same meditation on the fear itself, and then eventually he, the fear itself dissolved and disappeared. And then, you know, um, he had a kind of deep, deep kind of, um, can say, experience in that moment, you know. Um, and because of that deep experience of that one particular meditation in one session, it has effect for him, he said, for six months. For six months, you know, other people's behavior, attitude, actions didn't disturb him. You know, didn't disturb him. Sometimes people can be very attitude, you know, very critical, very criticizing very unkind, all kind of, you know, you, you meet all kind of people and in certain time, in certain instance, some people, but none of them kind of, you know, disturb him and he was able to keep his mind calm and peaceful. The effect that he has for six, after six months, then he started to kind of lose, you know, so that was why he wanted to, uh, you know, then slowly, slowly, and then he, he kind of become like back to his old experience. And so, and that's one something that he wanted to discuss. And, and my, my take on that is, that was not a realization itself, but it was a glimpse of that realizations. You know, glimpse of that realizations, you know. When you have the actual realization, then you will have that all the time, that, that understanding, that experience of understanding all the time. But when you have glimpse, sometimes you have in one moment of that glimpse of different experience, uh, spiritual experience or glimpse. And what it shows is the possibility of that one, the possibility that you can achieve that and the the effect of that, if you can have that realizations, if just one glimpse of that has effect, such a strong impact for six months, imagine if you have that realization all the time, what kind of effect you will have, you know? And so that is, that is, I know, I think again, it's a, I think it's, a, I want you to share because it is a, you know, normal, people who work and who and study and practice and they have they have those experience, even if it's a glimpse of experience, even though it's not the actual realization itself, but when you have that, even the glimpse of that, that can have a, such a strong impact 
on your mind, in your delusions, you know, and so. <clears throat> And one of the things, you know, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, is sometimes we have glimpses of such experiences and then, you know, we get attached to that experience because it's such a pleasant experience. And then we started to have grasping to that and then that become obstacles. And then also we want to do kind of, you know, have expectations because of that attachment and grasping, then it leads to expectation. And with that expectations, then you expect to have that experience in all your meditations. You want to repeat that experience because you had such a pleasant experience. So you want to repeat that experience in all your practice, in all your meditations. And when you meditate or when you try to practice with that kind of expectation, then your meditation does not go so well. There's something kind of forcing you to do that, to repeat that experience. So that, that becomes obstacles. And then that becomes more difficult to repeat that experience. In the first time, you have no expectations. So you are more kind of just doing the practice without any expectation. And when you do the practice without any expectation, then it produces more kind of those kind of experiences. But then the problem is then we started to, you know, grasp and cling on that because it's such a nice experience. And so then, and that clinging grasping and that expectations become the obstacles to produce similar or better experience of that. And so again, that is why when you try to practice meditate, it's so important for us to be practice without any expectations, you know, not because, you know, but just because I want to meditate, just because I want to practice and, and uh, no expectations. The med meditation can be a good, bad, it can, have, I, it can produce certain experience, it might not produce experience, whatever, you know. Just without any expectation, we just do the practice. And if we do that, then the, uh, the practice becomes, you know, better. You will have better result and better practice without that expectations. Uh, so, meditating on so always maintaining emptiness, always maintaining emptiness, you know. If we can all the time, wonderful. At least we try to meditate on emptiness once a day, you know, whether you do during the morning, evening, you know, that would be very good, helpful, beneficial, you know. Um, and you know, every day we go through different emotions, you know different emotions, sometimes we feel dis discouraged, you know, sometimes we feel, you know, um, lose self-confidence, sometimes we become, in certain moments, we become very impatient, frustrated, or sometimes very bitter, anger, you know, Or sometimes we might be in a state where we have very strong, you know, uncontrollable desire. Or feeling of jealousy, whatever, you know. And so due to all of that, it kind of disturbs our mental state. It disturbs our mental peace, you know. And not only it disturbs our mental peace and um, our mental state, then those emotions can lead us to act in an un unhealthy, you know, uh, in negative way that can be harmful and to others in oneself. So when that kind of things happen, recognize, you know, oh, you know, 
where you feel I'm upset, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm impatient, you know. That moment you try to say, you know, what is that I that is feeling so frustrated? Who is that I who is feeling so frustrated, so angry, so depressed? And if you try to analyze, and then, you know, as you do the kind of examinations, analyzes, you know, even though at the very beginning, when you feel very strong, you know, I'm very frustrated today. I'm very upset today. You know, I'm very angry today. You know, I'm very feeling very low today. You know, I'm feeling very discouraged today. So, you know, there's strong sense of I who is feeling, going through those different emotions, different feelings in that day, in that moment. And there's this strong feeling on that sense of, you know, I there truly, you know, I by itself from its own side. And then, you know, trying to say, where is that I that I feel so strong? That's feeling those different emotions so strongly, you know. Is this within the aggregate? Is this outside the aggregate? You know? It is the collection of aggregate. It is each part, each of the aggregate is part of the aggregate. So when we do the analysis, then it comes to a point which, where we cannot pinpoint, we cannot locate. And the sense of strong sense of self, or I will feel very strongly now, kind of disappear kind of dissolve, you know. And then we begin, we begin to kind of have some feeling, you know. There's no self as I felt before with the experience and those experiences. If there's no inherently or truly existing self, then there is no different emotion that has been experienced by that self. No. So then everything started to kind of dissolve and disappear. And when you feel that, and you, when you try to remain in that, uh, you rest in that emptiness. You try to, once you find to, that kind of with sudden analysis, examinations, sudden, um, contemplations and you come to that kind of point of empty of that, you know, the self that you felt very strongly before. And then, you know, you try to rest your mind in that emptiness. You try to experience and be in that, your mind in with that emptiness, in that emptiness. If you are able to do that, then, you know, all strong feeling that you have everything dissolved. No, there's no I who is experiencing anger. There's no I who is experiencing the um, frustrations of low you know, mind, discouraged and low, helpless, whatever. Mm. You can do that. Or you can meditate even same analysis to the emotion itself whatever emotion that you are going through. What is that emotion that you feel so strong at the moment? So you feel so concrete as to that you can kind of almost feel like you can hold on that because it's so strong, it's so concrete. But what is that feeling? What is that feeling? You know, does it, that feeling arise by itself from its own side? You know, and then again, you go through each of those parts that make that mind, that feeling, that emotions. Is it each part of that? Or is it the collection of that? Or is outside of each of those parts? And then again, when you do some kind of analysis, then again, at the end, you know, you cannot pinpoint. You can pinpoint and say, this is it. You know, even though you feel so strong before and feel like you can pinpoint and find there, but when you do that, you cannot find, you cannot pinpoint. 
again, it started to become less and less clear, less and less concrete. And slowly, you know, that feeling also kind of started to dissolve, disappear. You know, again, when you reach to that emptiness, spaces, emptiness, space, then again, you try to raise your mind in that emptiness. So through that kind of meditations, you know, whether it's the emotion, or whether it's the self which experiences the emotions, or whether it is the objects, whether the objects that is leading us to a strong desire, or whether it is an object that is leading us to a strong aversions or frustrations, whatever, and doing the same process to even the object itself. The, whether it's a, another being or whether it's a circumstances, you know, situation, even circumstances, whatever that, which we feel so real that that is the very, that object is the one that make me have strong desire or arise from strong desire or strong aversions. You know, again, what is that object? And if you do same analysis, again, you know, even though it feels so concrete at the beginning, as though you can kind of pinpoint and locate, find it. But when you do analysis, is it within the part? Is it outside with part? Is it in the collection and that again you cannot pinpoint, you cannot find, you cannot locate, become un more and more unclear as you do more and more analysis, examinations, and then it become more and more unclear, more and more uh, unfindable, and then again it dissolve and disappear into emptiness. And again trying to be in that um, trying to make on that empty emptiness as much as much as you can. So if we do that, then you can see, even though we don't have any kind of realization at this point, when you do that meditation, even though you might not have the realization of emptiness, even though you might not even have the glimpse of emptiness, but just by doing that meditation, you can see the differences. In the end, the strong, whatever those different emotions that you are feeling very strongly started to become less strong. It become more, more weak from being intense to much more lighter. So, you know, so you can see the effect of that practice meditation on small level, even in that moment, you know, <clears throat> even though it's nothing to do with realization at the moment, <clears throat> even though we don't have even glimpse of that, but even that, in, by just by doing that meditation practice, if you are able to do the meditations, you know, without much distractions and with the deep in that, even that moment, you can feel the differences that your emotion, whatever you're feeling with before, strongly. You, even if it's not totally gone, but you feel now, you know, much more lighter, much more subtle and not so gross and more so strong and not so intense. It started to have, even on that level. So, So that is so wisdom relies on the emptiness is the key to overcome all the delusion and the root of all the delusion to cut the very root of all the delusions. And in order that wisdom relies on emptiness, then we need to contemplate, meditate on emptiness as much as possible. Trying to study more and more, not only just study and trying to reflect, contemplate more and more, trying to meditate more and more, you know. Um, 
So yeah, so that is um, that is the advice. You know, that is the advice. Hmm? Always material emptiness. Always material emptiness. When we material emptiness, you know, and when is when you see the emptiness of the object of whatever different emotions, negative emotions that arises. When you see the emptiness of the objects, when there's no more of that objects, there's no emotion that arises. There's no more mind or emotion that's clinging, grasping to that object since there's no object. And when there's no object to cling on and grasp on, there's no grasping. And if there's no grasping, then there's no attachment or anger that arises on the basis of that kind of grasping. So, and uh, how that uh, then those emotion can stop the emotion from arising, you know. When you realize the emptiness of the objects. If there's no object, then there is no mind that's grasping, that's clinging and grasping on that. Hmm? So therefore that is why, um, one need to meditate on emptiness all the time, always. So that is, uh, you know, kind of what we describe in the teachings, uh, you know, meditation on emptiness, um, like a space, you know. Meditation on emptiness like a space, you know. Mm -hmm. And the next one is the meditation on the emptiness, like uh, illusions, you know. So there are um, two different kind of uh, type of meditation on emptiness. So first one here, the advice um, is to meditate on emptiness, like a space. Um, and next one is uh, the advice and um, instruction to meditate on emptiness like the illusions. So that should the object of attachment or aversions arises or appear, sorry, appear, view them as no more than illusion or project, projections. So that is what it is, you know. Um, So the advice is when any object appears, you know, um, to our mind that give rise to the attachments and that give rise to the aversions, you know, the object of attachment, the object of aversions, be another being, be another you know, sometimes it can be other beings, sometimes it can be yourself, sometimes it can be our own feelings, emotions, experiences, and sometimes it can be external environment, circumstances, situations, and whatever that might be, internal, external, you know, whatever that might be, um, trying to see, you know, even though those objects appear to our attachment and aversions as to they are inherent, as to they exist from its own side by itself, you know, from its own side by itself, but, but in reality, you know, it doesn't exist the way it appears to our mind and the way our mind perceives them, you know. That's not how things really exist. 
you know. Um, so remember and reminding that, you know, if it exists the way it appears to our mind, and the way we perceive those objects, then, you know, when we analyze it on deeper level, then, you know, we should be able to find within the objects. You know, within the objects, if it exists from its own side, then we have to be able to find within the object. And if we are able to find within the object, then we should, the object here means its parts. We should be able to find within the parts or outside of her. And when we do analysis, as we have done in the previous meditations, when we try to analyze that, then we cannot find within the each of those parts, neither outside of each part that can function at that, that particular objects. Even though that's the case, but when it appears to us, it appears as though you can find that object, you can pinpoint that object, you can locate that object, and that object exists from its own side by itself. And so therefore, you know, the way the object exists and the way it appears to our mind, there's a contradiction. You know, there's a contradiction. And so therefore, you know, there's a difference between the way things appear, the object appear to our mind, the, the way the object exists. And therefore, all these phenomena are like uh, illusions. You know, therefore it's illusion. In illusions, due to the magician's magic and tricks, something can appear to our mind, trick our mind and appear that, but in reality, that's not the real, in, that is what's really happening. It's just a trick, you know, it's just a, that's not the reality. And same way, similarly, similarly, the way things appear and the way it exists is uh, not the same. And therefore it's like an illusion, it's like an illusion. And the moment we understand is like an illusion, one we recognize that, one we understand and realize that is like illusions, then you wouldn't have a strong attachment or strong aversions. You know. It is when we think that object is real, not an illusion, but real, then that is when we have strong aversion and strong attachments. Mm. Because your understanding is a false. Your understanding is not real, it's a false. Even it looks nice, but you know it's not that way. It is just a false. It's not a real. And when you see that, then you have, you know, less strong attachments. Even though it feels and looks and feels is so bad, but we realize it's a false, that appearance, you know, that appearance is false. It is just illusions, like a illusions. Then again, you have strong, you have less strong aversions and anger. You know. And also seeing, you know, is all your mental projections. More than is, you know, is your mental projections then actually from its own side objectively, you know. Something appeared a nice, beautiful, attractive that lead to a strong attachments. You know, if you see some objects that looks, that appear, you know, that feel is a nice, beautiful, attractive, and therefore you have strong 
desire, craving, attachment to that, you know. Even to our mind, that beautiness, that attractiveness, that goodness, that positiveness, seems to appear from objective side, from its own side. And that's why we're attached to that. That's why we want that object. That's why we have craving for that object. That's why we want that object because in our, to our mind, it appears that object to be beautiful, attractive, good, positive from its own side, by objective side. But if we analyze, not just following just the appearance, but if you really analyze without just following the appearance, because appearance can be deceptions. So just instead of following just the appearance, if you use your wisdom mind to investigate, analyze, that is not how it can exist. That is not how that object exists. It appear, that appearance of positive, beautiful, attractive, pleasant, whatever that quality that we're attached to, is merely projection of your own mind. It's projection of your mind. Once we realize it's a projection of your mind, then you don't feel like I need that object because it is nothing to do with that object. It's my mind that projection that all qualities that I'm attached to. Those qualities I'm attached to is not coming from the objective side, but it's just my mental projection. It's coming from my mind. So therefore, there's no feeling of, you know, strong attachment, strong desire, craving that I need that object. I want that object. And if we really analyze, it's the true. It's all our mental projections. It's all on our mental projections. You know, the problem is we don't realize it's a mental projection and we believe it's uh, true from objectively. And that is the problem. You know, if it's nothing to do with our mental projections, if everything exists, let's say the object of our attachment exists whatever quality we're attached to as a positive, as a um, good, beautiful, attractive, whatever those different qualities were. If it exists from objective side, it's nothing to our mental projections. That should be the case for all sentient beings who experience that. But that is not the case. Something that is, appear beautiful to you, it might appear very ugly to someone else. Something that appeared to you very nice, it can appear very, very unnice, very bad to someone else. Something that appeared to you very positive and you are attached to that, to someone it can appear very negative. So why is that? Isn't it the same objects? Isn't it the same objects? Is the same object? Why does it appear something attractive to someone and unattractive to someone? Why does it appear something unpleasant to someone and pleasant to someone? Because of our different mental projections. Because of our different mental projection to the object. One mental projection is projecting as a beautiful. Other mental project, mind is projecting as a not beautiful. One mind is projecting is a positive and then mind is projecting as a negative. One mind is projecting as a um, pleasant and the other mind is projecting as an unpleasant. And that is where, you know, um, it all comes through mental projections, you know.
But the problem is when that object appear, whatever this positive quality is that we're attached to, to our mind, it doesn't appear that is my mental projections. It appear that quality from objective side and we believe that. And that is where attachment, strong attachment, desire, craving arises. Mm. It's the same with the object of aversions. You know, the reason we're aversions is because to our mind, you know, it appears, you know, something bad from objective side, from its own side, objectively from its own side, something bad, something negative, something, you know, um, bad, I know, ugly, unpleasant, you know, whatever quality that we, are, we have aversion to, whatever quality that we have aversion, that quality, it appears to our mind as existing from its own side objectively. And then not only this appears, then we perceive, our mind perceive and believe that. And then there is strong, you know, mind that want to distend from that, strong aversions wanting to distend from that, you know, and not being happy when we come in contact with that, you know, disturbing our mind when we come in contact with that, you know, that, that kind of aversions. But again, something that appeared to us as something very unpleasant, something bad, something negative, for another being, that same object, same situation, same event, same being appear differently, you know, as a positive, as a blessing, as something good, something a virtuous. And not only there's appearance, they believe that. They believe that. Your mind follow that and proceed that way and you believe that. And on the basis of that, you have different reaction, you know, emotional reactions or response. Whether it's attachment or whether it's aversion or whether it's neutral, depending on the appearance and your belief in that appearance, you know, or the way you perceive that once it has appearance. And so that is where, um, but again, that clearly, again, that clearly shows the, the quality of aversions that to whom we are, we have aversion, that quality do not exist as that quality from its own side objectively. It is merely, it is just projections of our mind. It's a projection of our mind. It's a projection of our mind. Once we realize it's a projection of our mind, you know, we don't have to be so upset and angry with that object because we know it's coming from more from our mind, more than anything else. You know, we don't need to destroy the objects. You don't, you don't need to be so angry and upset by the objects because you know it's, you're just, it's on your mental projections. And therefore, you know, no, no, need, no reason to be averse, have aversions, no reason to be angry, upset, and have hatred. Hmm? Yeah, Sharon. Instead, then we come to a conclusion that we have to change our own mind more than anything else. When you have that understanding, then it gives you awareness and understanding realization the need to work our mind more than anything else. At the moment, we don't feel that way. We feel like we have to kind of fix that, just the outside. It's always about fixing the outside and never kind of fixing our own mind. And we haven't been so successful by doing that, have we? 
all in whole our life, whenever there's problem, we are trying to fix outside. And we are not still free from the problems. Throughout the history of this world, the human existence, that is all we have done. And the problem hasn't gone. Even after so many years, the problem hasn't gone. Because we never try to fix our mind. We don't try to fix our mind and just trying to fix outside without fixing our mind doesn't solve the problems, you know. And that is why the problems in, our, in the world is always when there's something problem is pointing finger, out, finger to each others, blaming each others, fighting each others. You are the source of the problems. You created the problems. And the other person pointing back to you saying, I'm not, you are the one who is the source of the problem. You are the one who created the problem. You are the one who, who lead in these situations. Neither that other side, neither we think all is more to do with our mind. And how can I work with my mind? Hmm? By working with our mind, then we don't have to be so attached and so strong aversion to the circumstances and situation and individuals and so forth. You know, and then that will be great relief. That will be great relief and peace to bring a peace and relief in ourselves. And then we don't have to hurt and hurt us because we don't get upset and angry. And, uh, you know, so when we don't have upset and angry, hateful, then there's no reason to you to hurt someone else intentionally. There's no reason to hurt someone. Only when we are in the state of anger, hatred, aversions, you know, frustration, that's when we started to have those negative thoughts of possibly of hurting and harming someone else. And so, hmm? so that is, that is the, Today, maybe we'll kind of, um, I guess, uh, stop here. And I will, if there's any questions, I will, I will take if anyone has anything. Then our Geshiva Colleen has a question. Yes, please. Good morning, Geshiva. Um, I was just thinking that when I'm doing my meditative analysis, it seems like um, it's easier or somehow more important to analyze my negative uh, aversions than it is to analyze my attachments. It seems like the aversions are right in my face and my attachments are kind of sneakier somehow and kind of lay under the surface. And I'm trying to figure out a way to have a balance between how do I analyze them both equally? Well, you know, I think maybe attachments, as you said, can be more subtle. Whereas anger, more time come in more kind of um, gross level, more violent level. So it's more easy to kind of recognize it than the attachment it was subtle and it is so part. Of. But I think, you know, for example, you know, um, certain attachment might be more, um, noticeable for example attachment or dear one near one close ones we can see how much we waited and fear when about them and something happened to them and that is quite easily noticeable and so when you have that then it's you can use that attachments as the object of that you know um, something that's Maybe our attachment for food, maybe some people, maybe it's more noticeable for some people, they don't have so much 
strong attachment to food or a lot of other things. But I think in general, I think we have more stronger attachment to our dear, close families, friends, you know. Uh, that is quite, that kind of attachment more stronger uh, and it is more noticeable, you know. Um, and so maybe that might be a uh, way to recognize and a way to work with that. Yeah. Any, anyone, any other, any other one, anyone has any questions? Seems like space has a question, so. If we don't have caution, then we'll do the dedications. Mm. Okay. Um, due to the merits of this process action, may I affiliate in the state of Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the Supreme Jewel Bodhisattva that is not arising, arise and grow. And may that which arise and not diminish, but increase more and more. May all sentient beings everywhere plagued by the suffering of body and mind obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merit. May no living creatures suffer, commit evil, evil for ill. May no one be, be afraid, afraid or be little with a mind which down by depressions. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn and tall be restored and finding repose. May the naked find clothing, hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drink. May the poor find wealth, those who with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope and constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely events and bountiful harvest. May all medicine be effective and wholesome prayer bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be free from their ailments. Whatever disease they are in the world, may they never occur again. May the fighting cease be afraid, those bound be free. May the powerless find power and may people think of defeating each other. For as long as space remain, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then, may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining today. And have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, guys.